Kia ora and welcome to Cultured Conversations. I'm Kirsten Lacey, Director of Toyo Tamaki Auckland Art Gallery. Today we're right here in the magnificent atrium of our gallery, but I wanted to shift our conversation here to be with the public. It's why we exist. And that's a perfect introduction to my conversation partner today, Emily Cormack. Emily is a curator who is working in public spaces and is also the artistic director of Melbourne Art Fair, making artwork accessible to the public. A New Zealander working in Australia, but here you are back home in New Zealand, Emily. Welcome. Thank you. What a tough year it's been. What's brought you back from Australia home to New Zealand? Yes, it's been a year of pressure and release, really. Um, Melbourne, as people here may be aware, had a seven months lockdown. So we were in lockdown from March until October. And um, during that time, I was working full time, so was my partner, and we were trying to homeschool two children. So <laughs> it was a very challenging year. Um, and you know, because um, there have been some interesting upsides to COVID, uh, the freedom and flexibility that came with remote, remote working uh, meant that we were able to move to New Zealand, be with our family um, who needed us at that time, and um, have been able to put the children in school for the first time this year and really get on with our work um, from New Zealand. So we feel incredibly fortunate that um, we've been able to have this experience coming back to our homeland, um, both my husband and I are from New Zealand, so it's been a real privilege and, you know, a beautiful, beautiful time for us. Mm -hmm. You Great. come from my home, Melbourne, yeah. and here I am <laughs> welcoming you to yours. And it's the, the nature of uh, our times as you, as you describe it. Uh, the trans-Tasman relationship is the context for our conversation today, perhaps. Um, is there a common culture, do you think, between Australia and New Zealand? That we share? Well, it's an interesting question because if you're looking at it from a um, settler invader Pākehā perspective, the stories are the same um, or similar at least. However, when you look at all of the other forces that go into creating culture, landscape, terrain, um, indigenous experience, um, they couldn't be more different between New Zealand and Australia. Um, as you know, Australia is one of the longest constantly inhabited countries in the world with evidence of people living there for 70,000 years, whereas here it's only been 1,000 years. So even in, that, um, even in that, there is an incredible difference that feeds into the culture here. Um, I'm not sure how that manifests exactly or whether I could paraphrase it, but there is something intrinsic um, in that in the way that we relate to the land and um, the indigenous people that um, creates a difference between the two countries. But for me, it's not that productive to think about those differences um, too much. It's more interesting for us to think about um, ourselves in a geopolitical space within the world. We are in the periphery, looking out, um, often looking out to the you know, American, European canon from the outside. But I think that rather than thinking about that as a negative, um, I think that it's a freedom. I see it as a great freedom to be on the edge, on the periphery, because for me, I find um, all of the exciting things happen at the edges. You know, thresholds are where change happens, where transformation occurs. Um, when we push things to the edge is when we, you know, release blockages and we can, you know, have free-flowing ideas. And so I think that if we think about our position um, on the periphery as one of dynamism and activity um, and think about our relationship to Southeast Asia and South America and um, all of these other kinds of areas in our region and really focus on those um, and building a strong kind of collective culture together with all of the differences as part of that. Um, that for me is a more exciting way of thinking about trans-Tasman relations. <laughs> yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, because it, the peripheries are a really fascinating place to lead from as yes. well. And, yeah. uh, you know, we recognise that we often slip between leading from different positions, you yes. know, within our organisations. 
In terms of our industry, though, um, mm. you know, there are a lot of New Zealanders working in Australia and uh, a lot of Australians working here in New Zealand. Mm. What's your experience of that as an arts worker mm. and a cultural leader mm. uh, um, being in Australia what, for 20 years, 20 years. now yeah. um, as a Kiwi? Yep. Um, do you feel like you, you bring a part of your identity as a New Zealander to mm. your practice there and, and how mm. does that play out? Um, well, again, I, I, you know, of course I've experienced, you know, some antagonism because of my accent or, you know, people may have um, brought that up, but for me that's not the most interesting thing. I think it's, um, you know, we're very close neighbours and, you know, there's not much else around us, so it makes sense that there's this fluid reciprocity between New Zealand and Australia and all of my work has been very focused on activating those networks, um, you know, I'm very focused on bringing New Zealand artists to Australia in all of my exhibitions where I'm able to, I'll, you know, I'll draw in, um, you know, because my ideas naturally flow across both countries, I'll draw in New Zealand artists and introduce them to new audiences over there and vice versa over here. Um, so for me, you know, the, the, uh, there are New Zealanders everywhere in the Australian art world and um, there are Australians everywhere in the New Zealand art world. And so if we were in Europe, for example, that wouldn't be um, unusual. Do you know, the sort of fluid movement of, of arts workers around Europe is something no one necessarily comments on. So for me, I'd prefer to just think about us all as talented, curious people who are, you know, finding the best way to, you know, c connect art with audiences. Yeah, in the <laughs> South too. Yeah. Um, Interesting you, you, you say that because during lockdown we commissioned a work by a New Zealander who, who's based actually in Canberra yeah. about an issue that uh, she experienced firsthand, which was mm. the New South Wales bushfires in January this year uh, caught on the beaches of, at Batemans Bay, Alicia Frankovic. Yeah. I was in New Zealand at the time, and I think you may have been too, Emily, and the skies literally went mm. orange, mm. and in Alicia's work, she's taken the orangeness of the sky and recreated a series of vignettes that are performed inside an orange box, which was located here yes. in our atrium, yeah. and really spoke to the joining and the kind of shared environmental mm. experience and issues across yeah. the Tasman. Yeah. Um, that trans-Tasman arts practice is interesting, I think. Mm. Are there other examples of that that, you, that you're working with or have seen g coming to, to the fore at this particular moment, the COVID years? Mm. Well, that work was so profoundly disturbing and, you know, amazing, really articulated um, the strange sense that we have um, because when the cloud came over, you know, I was on a remote island in the Hauraki Gulf and um, the cloud came over and suddenly, you know, the trauma that was going on in our hometown of, of Melbourne and in, in the eastern coast of Australia really hit home and we felt it and we realised, and for me it was a very tangible um, metaphor for our interconnectivity, how intrinsically connected we are, not just with Australia, but with the world and how all of the, um, you know, our biosphere and our ecologies are all dependent on each other's. And, you know, to imagine, as, I mean, it was interesting with Alicia's work because it was inside a glass box. So there was this idea of the other or being separate from this experience. But really when the cloud came over, we were all reminded that we are subject to each country's different government policies. You know, we are all influenced by, um, you know, someone's reluctance to, you know, to um, meet climate targets or to you know, stop cutting down forests. or That influences us intrinsically and we're not othered, we're not separate, we're all interconnected. And I thought her work was so eloquent in thinking that through. Mm. This idea that the environment shares and has no national yeah. boundaries yeah. or borders yeah. is, is really what the work kind of touched yeah. on, I think. Yes. Because that cloud went all the way around the world. Mm. Mm, didn't it? Yeah. yeah. And it was experienced and felt by so many. Yeah. Uh, common humanity and mm. public work and public spaces. Mm. So you're, you're working, we'll get to the art fair, but you're also working in public 
spaces of a sort mm. um, in commercial hotel settings, mm. uh, stewarding commissioned uh, work um, for hotels here in, in New Zealand. Um, the Cordis is the main project I think you're working on at the moment. How do you bring some of these dialogues mm. into spaces mm. like that? Mm. Well, it's a sort of bigger narrative, really, how this, um, these kind of projects came into my practice because, for me, art is a capturing of forces. Um, and what that means is that, you know, art holds all of the forces of the community, of subjectivities, um, and it captures them and it holds them. And so then it reflects it back to us so we're able to under understand ourselves um, on a deeper level or contemplate ourselves through this capturing of forces that art is able to do. And um, public art has become quite interesting to me um, as I've explored this idea of art as a capturing of forces because public art is a capturing of community forces. And so implicit within that uh, political rhetoric, um, community intentions, socio-political ideas, um, and so all of those come into these great forces, uh, great gatherings of forces in public art projects. So the public art projects become a kind of monument to now. And that's a temporal thing, you know, as we've seen with Black Lives Matter and all of the, all of the sculptures getting, um, you know, re toppled. Yeah, toppled and, and readdressed and, you know, um, thought about in different ways. Um, those forces change over time. And I think it's a fascinating, challenging space to work in. Because often, um, you know, curatorial theory might imagine that an artwork is static, that its meaning is the same, um, and that we can, we can slightly shift it by putting it in different contexts. But when you put something out in the world, you put an artwork out in the world, um, that is totally out of your hands. It's in the composition of the world, you know, the choreography of, of the everyday. And it's a really interesting um, field to try and work with. And so I work for local government in Melbourne, and then um, I also work for, you know, um, you know, corporations doing, you know, public art commissions within their public spaces. So Cordis is one, um, 101 Collins is another. I've done Bendigo Hospital artworks. I've done art, you know, I've commissioned artworks everywhere. And always my intention with these public art projects is thinking through the forces of that space the forces that the visitor carries with them as they move through, and thinking about how the artwork can enliven, activate, um, and stimulate the visitor as well as the architecture. So, for example, at the Bendigo Hospital, it was a beautiful, long, um, you know, architectural space with a kind of latticed, open ceiling, but the energy of the space was being pushed out and dispersed right out each end. So they wanted artwork to kind of bring the energy back in and so that was part of the brief that I wrote for the artist. And, you know, we've got a beautiful Esther Stewart commission, um, which works in harmony with the architecture and the broader context of Bendigo and, um, you know, the patient experience. So it's a really interesting um, set of parameters and conditions to work with. And I really enjoy that challenge because I feel that art should be able to operate or it does, it shouldn't, it doesn't have, have to, but it has a, has the ability to operate in all terrain. Do you know, it has the, I'm a believer <laughs> in art, you know, I believe that it has the ability to um, connect with everyone and remind everyone of these sort of innate human activity of contemplation or thinking that, you know, these are sort of, these are sort of um, essential human traits which are not accounted for in other aspects of our, of our life. You know, they're not accounted for within commerce or, civic structures necessarily, but humans have the ability to contemplate and think through things, and public art is an opportunity to reflect that or encourage that in the public. Mm. And personally, the encounter yeah. of art in different spaces is, is, is really helpful, in fact, because yes. not only do we visit art galleries, mm. you know, with intent, yes. but, the, but the work you're doing in these commissions enables us to in, have encounters in the everyday That's movements right. and busyness of our, our yeah, lives. Exactly. Uh, another, another project, though, is the art fair, yeah. and it's a destination <clears throat> yeah. that you consciously yes. you know, choose to go yeah. to, and most people visiting are looking for the opportunity to bring something into their domestic mm. live settings mm -hmm. or workplaces mm -hmm. when they're visiting. How do you understand the idea of public 
and a broad public when you're setting out um, mm. creatively to shape and frame mm. an art fair, which mm. is at its core about um, mm. sales and mm. the commercialisation mm -hmm. of ideas mm. um, to, to create a buoyant uh, yeah. art industry mm. around it. Mm. Well, you know, art fairs and the art market are an essential part of the arts ecosystem. Um, you know, artists can't survive without art fairs. Um, I read somewhere that 70% of um, sales actually are occurring through art fair contexts. So to imagine um, that I'm a supporter of artists, but I don't support art fairs is very hypocritical. So if you want to support artists, if you want to give them opportunities, um, you need to support the entire ecosystem. And so working, in, um, working as the artistic director in the art fair has allowed me to think through exactly the challenges that you're talking about. How does an art fair commercial context work with what are essentially quite philosophical or experimental ideas that underpin my practice? Um, but it translates very well because the intention is the same. Um, you know, my intention is to provide opportunities for artists and provide opportunities for artists to create new work and for audiences to engage with that work. So whatever opportunity I have to do that, I'm going to jump at and try and make something really exciting. And, um, and so for the art fair, we, it was the first time they've ever had an artistic director and they invited me to come on and um, curate the kind of vision for the beyond section, which is the section of big public commissions um, in the spaces. So, you know, I, I did have the opportunity to curate the arrangement of the booths as well and try and make a sort of logical narrative as you moved through um, the exhibition and convention centre. But also it was more about um, introducing an overall vision um, for the installations within the beyond section, which are scattered across the entire space. So. For that, I really wanted to think through, because when you go to an art fair sometimes, one that's not considered curatorially, it's just a very front brain exercise. You know, you go, <laughs> you know, use a Len Lyism. You know, it's a very front brain exercise where you go in and you're just shopping and it's frenetic and it's stressful and, you know, it's an indexical approach of, of practices. It's not, there's no opportunity to get deep with things. And, you know, quite frankly, I find that a very unsatisfying um, encounter. And so what I wanted to do um, is offer the opportunity for visitors to engage with um, another part of their body while they were experiencing it. So all of the works that I was um, going to commission, are, well, I will be commissioning now in 2022 <laughs> because of COVID, um, they were works which activate the body. So, um, you know, they're works that talk about how we hold stories, history, knowledge in our bodies, and they, they connect with that aspect of um, the viewer's body as well. So it was also through works that um, affect you sensorially. Um, there was dance and movement. So, you know, there's that uh, mirror neuron idea where if you see someone moving, you start moving. So there was works that were drawing on that as well and um, large commissions of dancers thinking through um, storytelling with their bodies. And so I really wanted people to come in and their bodies to be activated as soon as they entered. And so then they could go through the spaces and really engage effectively with the artwork, which is often a way of engaging more deeply, right? Like, you know, we go in and go into a gallery and often it's something that, you know, gets us in the heart or in the guts that will stay with us. Um, but you have to be open to that. And in some ways that's the curator's job is to open people to that, <laughs> you know. So that's what I you know, that's what I'm hoping to achieve with yeah. the art fair. And in the context of the fair, they're often busy, crowded, yeah. noisy yes. places. So yeah. I love your approach of bringing performance into those spaces. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it's really, really exciting. You, you mentioned that the art fair's postponed until yeah. 22. Are there impacts of COVID on the world of art fairs that will have a longer standing legacy in how they're run and developed creatively? It's impossible to say, really, because we don't know how effective the vaccine's going to be, so we don't know how, we're, whether we're going to be able to encourage mass gatherings or um, you know, whether we're going to be able to invite people to attend performances, all of these things. You know, I was at the opening here the other night and I took photos from the balcony and sent them to my friends in Melbourne who were just in disbelief that there were 800 people gathering in a space together because, you know, it's... It's just not a possibility anywhere else in the world. But you have delivered the art fair digitally. 
yes, this yes, year. And yeah. so in terms of those changes, yeah, yeah. is there any of those uh, new initiatives that you'll carry forward with mm. you into the 22 program? Mm. Um, it worked quite well in that context. You know, we had lots of, um, you know, Instagram stories, studio visit interviews and all of these kinds of things. We did a lot of... Um, programming online that, you know, the digital art fairs went quite well all around the world. I think, you know, lots of people were, were quite interested in, um, you know, thinking about art while they were sitting at home, <laughs> locked in their homes. But at the same time, you know, nothing will, um, you know, th th there's nothing like the physical encounter with artwork. And I think that that's something that will always be present and necessary um, you know, when, in any experience with art, you know, we need to bring back the, um, the effective dimension of it. Mm. The art world loves congregating too, right? Yeah. I mean, they're a huge industry event, so you, you get to do so much business, but also connect with so many people at once from yes. all over the world. Yeah, you know. exactly. Um, so we, we look forward to the New Zealand Art Fair as yeah. well here in Auckland. Oh, it's a fantastic um, fair here. Yeah. But, I, I mean, we have noticed in terms of the economics of yeah, um, yeah, these definitely. entities that uh, because people have been uh, um, unable to travel, disposable incomes have still been quite mm, strong. That's you know, right. And yeah. um, the luxury goods market, which I guess you might say the art, yes. the art industry yeah. falls squarely in, yeah. um, ha has done quite, mm. quite well despite yeah. the fact that yep. that experiential yeah. offer hasn't been available. Yeah. Uh, to to people, mm. um, it'd be interesting to see mm. whether new collectors mm. um, that have been yeah. bought into the market carry with you into yeah. into twenty two. Yeah. I guess buying art is buying an experience. Do you know? So they'll get the work in their home, and then they'll be able to have a new experience. So you know, it's 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 interesting, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Look, mm. it's so wonderful meeting you and talking with you, Emily. Thank you for your Thank you time so much today. For the invitation. Yeah. All right. You've been listening to Cultured Conversations. My name's Kirsten Lacey. I'm the director of Toyo Tamaki Auckland Art Gallery. Thank you for your time and energy in joining me uh, in this conversation. We began these chats under partial lockdown and I'm happy to be here in a noisy open gallery. That's how I'd like these conversations to be. Please get in touch. I'd love to hear your comments, share your thoughts at aucklandartgallery.com and build the conversation of our culture.